All right, let's get started. So, can everybody see the projector just fine, by the way? All right, that's a yes. <laughs> so today's lecture will be on Git, which is, for those who don't know, a very easy way to collaborate with your teammates or anybody else on code. So let's get started. All right. So first of all, what is Git and why should we use it? Uh, just before we start, just quickly show of hands, how many people here have used or heard of Git before? Okay, so most of you, but not all of you. Uh, Git is basically sort of like the common standard for a lot of coding projects. You'll probably have to use it at some point at your time at MIT. And you're also probably going to have to use it if you ever collaborate with other people on projects, such as battle code. So Git is essentially just a way for you to track your code changes and collaborate with other people, sync code changes, as well as, as a lot of handy other tools, including version control, et cetera. So why should we use Git in the first place? Well, let's think of a couple alternatives, you know, that you might use if you don't have Git. Uh, the first thing is maybe you can just, you know, edit your files on your local repository, run them, make sure you have changes, then just send them to your teammates on some kind of zip. Uh, this is bad for a number of reasons, but one easy and immediate reason why it's not very good is because it's really hard to get the naming convention right. And after a while, you're going to end up on like final project parentheses 13 or something like that. So not great with naming, and it's also not very useful if you want to see what changes other people have made and sort of how you can sync them all together. Another thing that people like to do sometimes is Google Drive. You know, just pull up a doc, call it like referenceplayer.java, and uh, you can all collaborate on a fun Google Drive doc. Uh, this is not very good for, another, for its own reasons. First of all, when you're editing code and somebody else is on the same doc as you, your screen is constantly going to be moving around really inconvenient for a UI. And also it's really hard to actually just run the code. You're gonna have to like copy paste the code every single time uh, into like an actual code editor where you can run it. And this is really inconvenient. So one reason that Git is really useful is that it helps you collaborate with others really easily, both editing files, running files and sharing files with other people. Git also has a number of other handy features. It has stuff like branching. So imagine you want to test a new, very volatile change to your robot. Maybe it's going to improve your win rate, maybe it's not, but you just it takes like 20 lines of code or more to implement. So you just try implementing it, you run it, and it turns out it's a bad idea. Well, with Git, you can essentially use branching to make that a lot easier. And so other people don't have to look at all of these changes you made to your code. You can revert those changes really easily. And if they do turn out well, it's really easy to merge back into the original code base. So branching is one big reason that Git is really useful. The other is version control. So let's say you accidentally delete your repository, which you know hopefully shouldn't happen, but it inev inevitably will to some people. So like it's really useful for just going back maybe like two or three days ago or maybe two hours ago and reverting to a previous version of code that didn't have bugs or issues or other uh, complaints. So that's a number of reasons why Git is useful. Now, how can you actually use Git and what is it? So Git is essentially, there's two parts of Git that you really need to worry about as part of battle code. The first is Git itself, which is an offline system for tracking all of the changes within your code. So if you imagine you have a local repository stored on your computer, Git is used to essentially take any changes that you make on that local repository, uh, track them, and make sure that they get placed in the right locations. On the other hand, GitHub, which is uh, which you can access via the web and a number of other ways, is essentially a central place where all of your teammates can share the Git repository. So let's say you have a team of three, and each person is working on different changes in the code. Each person can use Git to modify their local repositories, and coordinate all the changes into one place on GitHub, which is super helpful and super useful. Uh, GitHub is also really nice because it's online, meaning that if you somehow lose track of your code or delete it or something like that, all of the changes are just online. So you can just grab your repo fresh from the GitHub and it's as if it's good as new. 
So let's get started. And if you haven't worked with Git before, which you know some people here haven't, then this is how you can essentially get Git set up. So to set up Git, you go to this link here, git-scm.com slash downloads. This will essentially allow you to download Git and let you use it from your computer terminal. And this is very handy because this is what you're going to need to essentially track all the code changes on your local side. So if you don't have Git, go to this website, uh, super handy. Uh, if you already have Git downloaded, you should also go to github.com. This is once again, just GitHub. So you just wanna navigate there, make an account. It might request for two-factor authentication or whatever. Uh, just get that set up and you'll be ready to go with uh, using Git with the rest of your team. Uh, once you get all of that set up, uh, one thing that you can do is you can basically change your Git config. So if you imagine you have like 10 people working on a project or even like three, um, you might get some issues if everybody is just committing and changing the code anonymously. You see one change here, it completely destroyed the code base. You want answers. Who destroyed the code base? Who was it? Uh, well, with configs, you get to know. So. Uh, if you type in these, it'll basically put your name and your email on any commit you make. This is really useful if you just need to track down who made a change and be like, hey, why is this change here? Uh, what was the reasoning behind it, et cetera? And that's super handy for working with others. So uh, if you don't have this set up, just go through these right now. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, on either the YouTube chat if you're online or the lectures channel in Discord. Or if you're in person, just raise your hand and we'll get around to helping you uh, so just get this done first. So we'll probably just sit here for a couple of minutes for anybody to set this up. If you guys still need a bit more time after that, we can just go on a little bit longer. In the meanwhile, let's talk about some other reasons why Git is helpful. So previously we mentioned a couple of things like Git branching get uh, version control. Uh, just to be clear on what this exactly means, uh, imagine you have a code base and you need to make a change. Branching is more or less, you can think of it as like creating a parallel universe of your code. What if we did these changes instead? Uh, this is especially helpful if you're changing like five files, 10 files, a lot of big changes that you don't, that are not easy to just, you know, copy paste into a separate location. If you create a branch on Git, you'll essentially get a copy of your entire repository, which you can change at, on your own pace. Um, and if these changes don't turn out well, you can revert. So that's one very handy feature of Git. Another handy feature, version control. Um, this is especially useful because let's say you test two versions of your robot, you make some changes and you wanna see like, is this actually a good change to make? Does it beat my old robot? Well, if you didn't have the foresight to, you know, copy your old robot into a separate file, you can essentially just use Git version control to revert to maybe the code two days ago. And now you get two copies of your code and you get to have them fight it out on the arena and see which one is actually better. So this is actually a very useful trick uh, for battle code. If you just want to test some local changes quickly without uploading a bot to our page, fighting a bunch of other competitors with scrimmages, you can just test your bot against yourself, um, either through earlier versions. Just keep in mind that you need to run multiple times often because of RNG, and you also need to make sure that uh, the change is actually helping and you're not just overfitting on your old bot. Uh, so handy tip for battle code. All right, anybody still need more time to set this up or? All right, let's move on then. So how does Git actually work um, outside of, you know, being a magical black box where we toss changes in and get what we want out? Uh, Git is actually, you can think of it as four stages for your code. Now this graph here looks pretty complicated if you're not familiar with it, but it's not as complicated as it looks. And once you start using it, it becomes quite intuitive as to why it's set up this way. Uh, what's more important is you need to understand what each of these four areas are so that you can use it relatively properly. Uh, the most important piece, in my opinion, is the workspace. 
the workspace is essentially just your local copy of the code. Let's say you, you know, like make some changes on your own end and you just hit save. That's all contained within your workspace. So that's what you're actually running when you hit the run button on VS Code, when you, I don't know, like compile a tournament in our client, uh, to compile a match in our client. That's all the local copy. Um, beyond the local, uh, the local copy or the workspace, there's the staging area. A staging area is essentially where you want to put all the changes that you want to give to your teammates in one place. So let's say you make four changes to four different, uh, four changes among like four different files. Then if you want to commit and give all of your, give your teammates all of these changes at once, you put them all in the staging area where you're basically saying, yeah, these are ready to be committed within, uh, these are ready to be committed within one sort of batch change. Uh, beyond that, you have the local repository, which is essentially your copy of the repository uh, outside of GitHub. So just to be clear, I realized I didn't go through this earlier. A repository is essentially just a big code base. You can think of it as the big folder that covers everything. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's more or less what it is. Um, so once all of the staged changes are ready, you can commit them into your local repository, where it's essentially stored on your local side. And this is where you're basically saying it's ready to be sent to everybody. Um, and finally, you have the remote repository, which is actually what's online. So once you push to the remote repository, your teammates can grab your code, see the changes that you made, and plan accordingly around that. And the remote repository is also what you'll be viewing on GitHub if you pull that up. So there's also some pretty handy commands between these areas. Uh, we'll be going over them now uh, in like a live demo here, and you guys can try following along uh, just to see how Git works. Uh, but these are just the media commands that you might want to know on how the code can move between these four areas. So now Ruth will uh, show you guys how to do that. Okay. Okay, there you go. So the first command we're going to look at is the clone command. So clone downloads your remote repository onto your local machine. So here we have the remote repository called Battlecode 24 Lecture Player. And I want to put it onto my machine. So I'm going to go copy the URL. I'm going to go to my terminal, which is in VS Code. And yeah, I should have opened a new VS Code. Let's see. You're ready. And now once this loads, I'm going to run git clone and then put the URL in here. And then what this does is it downloads a file called battle code lecture play onto my computer, complete with all the things that you need for git. So now I can open this in my VS code. So open battle code 24 lecture player. And now I have it here. So we're going to start by looking at the lecture player. So let's say there's some changes that me, we might want to make here. So notice here we have a pathbind. We have some pathbinding algorithms, but this is pretty simple. It has a location, and it tries to move towards the location. If it can't move towards there, it will either try to fill in the location in front of it if it's water. And if it can't do that, it will just move around randomly. So we might think that we can do better than this. Does anyone have any suggestions for any way that we can improve this one so that it spends more turns trying to get to the target instead of moving around randomly? Just as an aside, this is the lecture player that you guys that we worked on in the previous lecture. You can also find this code under the Battlefield organization, which is Battlefield from the lecture player. So if you ever need code passing, you can find it on our Yeah, so one thing that we might want to do is that we notice right now it's trying to move towards a direction, and if it can't, it just kind of gives up and chooses a random direction to move towards. Well, if it also can't fill it, but what we can do instead is that if it can't move in this direct direction, it can move to right to the right or right to the left, because that way it's still relatively moving towards the target, 
but it's also like getting around the obstacle that might just be one block wide. So what we'll do is we'll add some else if statements. So the rotate left and rotate right, in case you haven't seen them so far, it just takes this current direction and finds a direction that's directly to the left and directly to the right of it. So here we do rotate left, and then right below, we're going to do a rotate right. And then I'll probably leave a comment just in case anyone else comes to check on this code. So now I have these changes. I'm going to quickly save it. And I can see what is going on with the changes with this new command called git status. So what git status does is it takes a look at all your current files and tells you what's in the working area that hasn't been staged yet, what's in the staging area that isn't in the local repository yet. If I run git status now, you'll see changes not staged for commit. And right now, the change that is not staged for commit is right here in lecture player pathfind. And it is this, this thing that I just added right now. So now what I can do is git add and put the name of the file that I have that I see here. And what this does is moves it from the working area, which we see here, into the staging area. So if I do that, and I'm going to run git status again just to see that it is now in the staging area. So in the staging area, it's called changes to be committed. And next, I'm going to run git commit which is going to move it from the staging area into the local repository, which from this diagram, it's just going to go from this blue area to this green area. And for git command, you'll notice I'm doing a dash M right before, like right after git commit. This is a message I'm going to leave so that when I make this commit, that other people can see what I changed. So I will say, make it so it tries to go left and right. So now you'll see that it changed one file and made four insertions. So now I have this change on my local computer, but what I want to do is put it onto the remote repository so that Andy can also see it. So finally, I'm going to do a git push. And this is just going to upload it to the remote repository. And Andy's going to look at it and make some changes. In the meantime, we'll go onto the GitHub website to see what you can do there. So you can see in lecture player that the commit that I made right now, you can see it right here, make it so it tries to go left and right. You can click into it, and inside of it, you can see that I have added these couple of uh, lines. So this is also a great place to look at some other things. For example, if you have some other branches, which we will look at in a, in a later in this lecture, you can look at the branches here. You can look at issues, pull requests. You won't really use any of these other tabs for battle code, but they will be they will be useful if you ever use GitHub for any other projects. You could also edit files directly in GitHub, but in general, it is bad practice to do that. So edit it on your, on like a VS code and then up and then push it to GitHub. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? So just review, we've looked at these three commands. And in a moment, we're going to look at the pull command, which is going to let us take any changes that anyone else makes and put it onto our computer as well. So we go here, and we run git pull. And we can see here is that there was just a change. This change is in pathfind, and there were three insertions and one deletion. And you can see that this part has just changed. And we can also go onto the website to see what has been changed. So if we go on the website, we see that Andy has made a change where he tries to fill before trying to move to the square. You might want to do that because if the square isn't filled and then you fill it, then you should theoretically be able to move towards it. So that might be a good change we want. And if you click on it, you can see the exact change that he made. All right. Does anyone have any questions about these main four commands? If not, we're going to move on to branching in a moment.
Yes, you can always look them up online if you forget about them. Don't worry, everyone forgets at first. So let's say you have a new feature and you think this feature is really great. And as Andy mentioned, you want to test it out, but you don't know that, you don't want to like mess with your current code because it's also pretty great. So what you do is you create a new branch and your branch could be like this. And you can make as many changes as you want to your branch and it won't affect the main branch. And then when you're done, you can then put it back in the main branch. And similarly, someone else can also make some changes on their own branch and then put it back as well. So in this case, I'm going to go to my, where is my VS code? Okay. So I'm going to go to my code and then I'll see right here that here we first get an action update and then we do a capturing update. But maybe I think that this would be better if we did a healing update right after we did action. So I'm going to do git branch, create new branch called healing update instead. So this is going to create the new branch. But we're still not on the branch yet. So we have to do git checkout, checkout in order to be on the branch. Now see that once we do that, we can we have switched to this new branch. And now any change that we make will be isolated to the single branch instead of being on the main branch. So while I'm here, I'm going to say, change this to healing and change this to healing as well. And then does anyone remember what the command is that we use? So we do get status and we see that there's it has been modified, but it hasn't been put into the staging area yet. Does anyone remember the command we can use if we want to put it into the staging area? I see a lot of people have come in, so I guess I'll just quickly recap what we have just been doing. So I made a new branch, and then now I am just made some change in this branch. So now I have these changes in my working area. So to put them in my staging area, I'm going to do git add. But this time, instead of git adding the file, I'm going to do git add dot. And what this does is it adds everything under here, every change that's not staged for commit into the staging area. This might be useful, for, say, for example, if you change 10 different files, and then you don't want to add the file name of every single file. So in this case, you would use git add dot. So if you change 10 files and you think that only one of them is a really good change, then you would use git add the file name. You can see I do git add dot. And then if I do git status now, you'll see that it is now in the staging area. And then does anyone remember how we get from the staging area into the local repository? <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> so true. We do a git commit. And then if you remember, there's something we have to add after the git commit. Does anyone remember what that is? Yes, we have to do a dash m. You could do it without dash m, but then it tries to open up Emacs, which doesn't work in my VS code. So it's easier for me to do dash m. And then I'll give this a name like update the chain global update to to healing. So I've made this change. And then do you guys remember what you do to get your local repository onto the remote repository? I think I heard someone say it, it is git push. So we git push it. And you'll see that now we have this error. And this is what always happens when you create a new branch locally. It's not important what this thing does. You can just literally copy and paste it. And this will just set the remote to have this, this branch as well. So now if we go onto the remote and we take a look at it, we'll see, oh, we go back to battle code. We'll see that we have two branches, main and healing update. And we go into healing update, you'll see that I've made this change, change global update two to healing. All right, so next is, so now we have this great update and we're like, okay, this is fantastic. How do I put it back onto the main bot so that my entire team can use it? But we have something for that called git merge. And what git merge is, is it takes your current, you go onto a branch and then you take another branch and then you combine them together using this command called git merge branch one. 
So I can go on here. I can go check out git checkout main because that is the original. And then I can do git merge the healing update branch so that now the main will have healing update too. And it is that right now on the main branch, it doesn't have the healing update. It's still on capturing. But once I git merge healing update into it, you'll now see now it's healing. So this is great. But then if I go back and look at the GitHub right now and go back onto the main branch, let's see. It looks like Andy has made some changes and I probably should have pulled it before I did anything else. But it's okay, I can always do it now, git pull. And then now you see that we have some issues. So, yeah, I probably should have. And then this is what we call a merge conflict. It's like when you try to merge two pieces of code, but both codes have somehow been changed. And then the Git doesn't, Git tries its best to put the two pieces of code together, but doesn't really know how to do it. So you get a merge conflict. So now you'll see this merge conflict right here. It says conflict, merge conflict in src.lectureplayer main phase Java. And all you have to do is take a look at these two different updates. So the current is the one that I have on my computer. The incoming is what Andy has pushed to the remote repository and is trying to push to my computer now. And all you have to do is delete one of them. So does, do you guys want to vote on which one to delete? Who wants to delete the first one? And who wants to delete the second one? Wow, it looks kind of even. Um, <laughs> we're going to vote again. Everyone has to vote. Delete the first one. Raise your hand. OK, one, two. Three. OK, delete the second one. Raise your hand. All right, it looks like the first one is going to get deleted. So all we have to do here is just delete everything. Like we delete these all these little arrows and the word head and all these equal signs. So those good goodbye. And once it's done, we delete all these arrows too. So it doesn't cause a syntax error in our code. And then now we can just command save. If we run git status right now, you'll see that you have unmerged path. So it's saying that it's still seeing the two paths and you need to then commit it to save your new changes. So does everyone remember how we get this, like get these from the working area to the staging area? Feel free to just shout out, yes. <laughs> git commit is in a moment. Very good, but yes. Oh, git pull takes your remote repository and puts it onto your local machine. There's something right before git commit that you need to do. Yes, very good, git add. In this case, I'll just use a dot, even though I could use the name of the file. And now if we check git status, it still needs to be committed. So now we do a git commit, and then we can leave you a message that says merge the conflict or something. And then does I remember how to get this, like this code then onto the remote repository? Although it's like the same code as a remote repository right now, but. Yes, you now get push. And then you are done. And one last thing is that we the git log. So if you look at git log, you can see like all the changes that people have been have made to this repository. So you can see that the very first change is I don't I think I only show the last three changes, but you can show that there was a change where Andy thought that capturing the cooler upgrade, so he made that upgrade. And then I tried to pull in a change that changed global upgrade to healing, and that caused a conflict. So then I merged the conflict. And this is helpful because then you have this ID, and you this ID can go back to any point in the repository if you want to like go back in time. And then if we look in the GitHub, you can also see, for example, if I reload here, I can see that I merged the conflict. And another useful thing is that if you look at the seven commits, you can also see the commit history here. You can copy the ID here if you want to then go back to any point in the history of the repository. So here's just a review of the commands that we went over, the basic ones, not the branching ones. So first you clone it to get the remote repository onto your computer. Then depending on how you're doing it, if you're doing a VS code, you can skip the second step. And then after that, you git add all your changes and then you get commit with a message to put your changes into the local repository. And then after that, you get push to share changes with everyone else. And at some point you'll probably need to get pull because you don't want to just have your own code. You want to like see everyone else's code as well. And then here's a couple other useful commands that you might want to do. 
So for example, let's say you made a really big mistake and now none of your code is working. What you can do is revert back to an older version. I think the command is git revert, but it's probably on the cheat sheet. And to revert back to the older version, you just use the, you just copy the ID for which version you want to go back to. And finally, let's say you made some changes and then you don't really remember what those changes were, but you haven't like pushed it into the staging area yet. So you can do is git stash. So it removes your changes from the workspace and puts them in a temporary space. So you can see what the code used to look like before you changed it. And let's say you looked at it and you were like, okay, my changes were pretty good. So you can get stash pop to put them back on. And from there you can get add and then get merge, get commit and then like get push. So finally, here's some other useful tips. So you should learn how to use the git command line per pretty well because that'll be what you're using most of the time. But if you want to track versions, there's things like git kraken. They also like, they let you see the branches, they let you see who's worked on what. And Git Kraken has a pro version that's free with the GitHub Student Developer Pack, which all of you should have because all of you should be college students. And finally, here is the Git Cheat Sheet. So you can see that some of the commands are here. You could probably just command F if you ever forget how to do something. And that's it, thank you. Let, uh, let us know if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Also, I know some people came in later. If you have any questions about any part of the Git, we'll go around and help you guys out. Besides that, uh, feel free to just stay, work on your robots. If you guys have any questions from the devs on strategy, how to get the thumb, we won't be helpful.